All right, and I'm going to talk a little bit about ergonomics um, for those of us who are in their mid 40s and making clay. Beyond. <laughs> <laughs> Song. I am coming to you from the basement studio at my home in Plainfield, Illinois. Um, I'm going to start working on a big vase for the throat arch of my training kiln and talk through some of the things that I'm thinking about um, as I'm making a larger piece. I am still not super comfortable with throwing large. Um, it's been a lot of figuring out the clay value, especially. So this is a mixture of several plays. This is my reclaim clay. So what it's got is some um, stoneware from uh, Mike Taylor in Michigan that is super fantastic. It flashes really well, but it doesn't seem to want to go tall. It wants to be fixed dropping kind of. So it is mixed with b -mix from Laguna. Um, it's a wood fire b -mix. And then also I started using porcelain. So there's a little porcelain in there. But I find that um, it really has been lovely to have all three clay bodies mixed together in my reclaim. It will hold up better for going tall. So let's see how that goes. When I wedge things up, um, what I try and do to save my wrists is to really go ahead and take some time to um, slam it down sideways also so that it's quite round before it even gets to the wheel. And then uh, this is a hydro bat that I have soaked with water. So there's quite a bit of water in here. I don't know if you've ever had a thing with a plaster bat where the clay will actually sort of release and leave a big bubble under your piece. So I find that uh, hydrating that bat really well ahead of time, just sponge lots of water. And then here goes the fun stuff. We're gonna plunk down. All right, then to save my wrists, I have a beautiful short gunner paddle. Start beating this down from the top. Really helps to adhere it, and then also from the side. See this regularity. Okay, now I am going to uh, hop up off of my stool to get myself leverage. So I'm going to center this stand up. I'm going to go ahead and find a decent speed, reasonably fast, but I'm going to go ahead and do a squat. I'm going to try and lean in to keep my back flat as I'm centering this. And I'm going to go from the top down to really adhere the piece to the wheel. Oh, isn't that fun? Can you guys hear me okay? <laughs> So here I'm going to just, uh, it took forever to make this piece. So there's a bunch of spots where I'm going to speed up. And if you would like to unmute and ask questions, you can. Um, I'm starting out with, I meant to write it down. I think it's like eight pounds of clay. And then I'm going to plunk down another um, like seven pounds on top of it. So here I'm cleaning the slip off of there. And then I'm going to go ahead and boom, the next part on it. Paddle it again. Um, yeah, and you know, for, for the amount of play that I have on there, this thing should have been absolutely ginormous, but somehow um, I end up throwing about a foot in a uh, cubed and then uh, trim a bunch off. I think I've still got some, I don't know, the, the curve of it, it still needs that support, I feel like. So when so, you wedge that much clay, do you, do you wedge on the floor? Uh, I throw down the, um, I throw down the bag of clay and then I go ahead, that softens it into something that's workable. And then I wedge it on the, the surface. Troy, I don't know. I feel like the panel's working great. Do you think that it should be? He may or may not have some larger paddles. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't even make that paddle any longer. Uh, <laughs> I, make, I make larger paddles. Uh, I even made a mallet the other day that weighed about four pounds for a wow. guy. Wow. 
Oh, here, hold on a second. We're gonna turn this one back on. All right, so more to see from this angle. All right, so uh, another Troy tool. Shout out to Troy. So glad you live within driving distance. So I'm gonna um, be compressing the, the bottom out, out this way. Um, just a little tip for folks who might be newer to pottery. Um, if you're compressing the bottom of your piece and it starts to catch, the rib starts to catch, and then you know how it always gets worse. Um, what I recommend is going back with a sponge and with your hand uh, going back over the, the bottom of the piece, fix that, and then go back with the tool. And so then what's gonna happen is um, that catch is now gone and your clay, your clay tool will be happier for lighting over the, the piece and doing what you want it to. Once it seems to do that uh, chattering on the, the bottom of the piece, there's just no going back. I love that, all right. So let's see, uh, Lauren, I will throw my platters. Uh, I've started doing a full bag and then it's ridiculous how much gets trimmed off of there. Um, so it ends up being like a five pound platter after all is said and done. I just like to um, throw the shape that I want with whatever clay needs to support it um, and then get it to the right weight by just really taking my time and trimming it back. So, and here's, so I'm going to start getting some volume into it here. It's going to look really scary for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shout out to Eddie Bauer's um, fleece lined pants. Those have been the best in the Midwest. Um, they can get a little wet, but you're still warm in your cold Midwestern studio. Nice. I wear the flannel jeans when I wood fire and then I don't feel singed. <laughs> yeah. I find these are really comfortable. So I really like them for loading the kiln too. They're just warmer than the flannel line pants, but you can't fire in them. No. <laughs> you don't only do it once. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah, <laughs> stop the firing. <laughs> And I really try, I, I throw in front of a makeup mirror. And so I really like getting that immediate feedback on like the shoulder of the piece. And then I'm trying not to get a real uh, sharp angle on that because the, the wood fire will just catch the, the shoulder of it and give it one color and it'll do a totally different shade underneath the, uh, the curve. So I am like, I've kind of made that mistake and I'm trying to make a really nice shoulder on it. And then don't worry, I'm going to change the lip later because that's, that's ridiculous. <laughs> it's so funny to watch things in time lapse. <laughs> Yeah, so this will get side fired in the front of my uh, uh, thread arch on its side. All right, and I've started to do, it only, I got to time it. I, it only took me like uh, six minutes to uh, create that little chuck, but because the clay was a little bit soft and I wanted to trim it when it was soft, um, it was a nice way to kind of couch the, the top of the piece. All right, and then here's some trimming and I'm gonna leave the sound on for the time lapse because it's pretty fun. And a little button level for getting it just right on here.
That's a really cool trimming tool. What is that? Yeah, and and Marvy Leah made that for me. It's some sort of strap metal with a string on it. Awesome. Oh. So here's where all that heavy clay goes away. And I'm going to pick it up a bunch of times uh, and just kind of keep feeling it for weight until it gets to where I want it to be. That's the sound I love. <laughs> I can't get enough of the tapping. All right, I'm going to put a, uh, a foot onto it that's going to get carved. And I can bevel the fit, foot to uh, mirror the, the lip that's going to go on there. Yeah, it's supposed to be a plate trimmer, but I love it on a big basis too. It's a nice plain line. Making more replaying. Love the form. All right, so I broke a sure form to make it smaller. Uh, Denise, I still need to order the other little rasp. That's yes. really cool. I'm telling you, that thing is great. It's so tiny. Uh, Amazon. <laughs> I, I can share the link Denise shared with me. She saw one of my videos. She's like, you need this. And I'm like, I do. <laughs> No, I really want to know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a little uh, nutmeg grass, you know, like a grater, but it's got a round top. Oh. Sound for that. All right. So now I'm putting on a lip. Um, this piece was finished like, was that yesterday? <laughs> on my daughter's 16th birthday, right when I had to pick her up from school. So it is wrapped tightly. And I think I will probably um, give the lip a little bit more love when I get home. Um, but in for an atmospheric firing i'm really trying to give um some nice edges both on the foot and on the top to catch catch the ash so that's how it's looking right now cool and then because it'll get um side fired i bet that that rim is going to go off center too so i'll have fun um trying to load that such that it'll um it melt we, we fire really, really hot at my kiln. <laughs> so. Do you ever use crowns? Um, no. Well, you'll have yeah. to do my talk tomorrow when I talk about crowns. <laughs> <laughs> Can do. Um, is that all right? I know we don't want to cut into Lisa's time. Is that all right if I go write any quick questions about that? Or I've got uh, a video that my friend Alex put together about my workshops. Oh, feel free to roll that and then we can do the Q&A and go from there. All right. Sounds good. Let's see. Yeah. So Alex Olson is a um, wood firing potter. He's now in Brooklyn. So he's further away, which makes me sad, but he has done some beautiful photography and work at my barn. Fancy, fancy videography. <laughs> Welcome to Riverstone Pottery. We are just finishing the unload from a workshop firing that I led with six awesome people who are new friends. I'm very excited to get to know them. I had the overnight crew tap in the damper stitch, which I thought would uh, give us a few more hours and a little bit more ash on pots. But what it actually did was extend the firing from a usual 37 hours to 44 hours. So I was very anxious to see if that extra work and sweat and tears led to anything 
awesome and it totally did so i'm excited to reveal some of what we got um just so you know this is a train kiln and so the idea is you put lots of firewood we end up going through two cords at least of um, firewood in the firing and then all of those embers and ash they uh, trickle down and they pile up on the floor and there's air and a current that's pulling through the work. So all the pots get stacked up in here uh, and then it carries out the chimney and that draw really pulls everything through. So um, we've unloaded the middle stack and Oud and Odd and seen some of the tragedy that also happens with wood firing. But um, here's one of the pieces that really made me think, oh, I want to fire like this again. This is from Jason Elher in Logan Square, Chicago. And um, what I saw, this was placed in the middle floor and there's way more ash and flash than we would tend to get in this quiet spot sort of tucked into places. So that was an indication of good things to come. Also, um, this is one of Andrew Linderman's vases. So here's kind of some of the stuff that we're looking for. We're getting some grays and some contrast. And then we've got little crystals uh, forming along the edge of the glaze. Um, this is what gets people addicted to wood firing is when you live with these pieces, um, you get you get to like be mesmerized by the little ash strips and you get to see the little gold plaques that come out. You know, it's more when you get to live with it that you get to see all of the um, the, the variation and the beauty in what you got. Um, also, there is some sadness when you were unloading a wood kiln. This is one of Alex Olson's unfortunates where it got knocked over in the firing and it fused to the floor, um, which is such a shame because look at these little riblets going to the side and you've got um, absolutely ash buildup. This is has no glaze on it whatsoever. This is just the wood ash interacting with the clay body over 44 hours of tending the fire. Um, and this is the reward. This is the risk. So fortunately, this is pulled from the back stack. Um, so usually this would be so much more quiet to be very white, but those extra hours of time and that heat work um, so this is one of Alex's again, absolutely nothing on it, but that uh, subtle subtlety and the facets just picked up so much contrast and beauty. And then here's a reward for you finishing your bowl um, is when you're eating out of it, you get to slowly reveal what's going on in there. Looking at the front of the kiln, we just got a lot more richness. I was going for uh, what they call a reduced firing, where it's going to have a lot more brown and richness. We've got a whole lot of that going on. So this is one of uh, Julianne's pieces. She's up from um, Indiana. So that clay body color is just so warm and beautiful and subtle. Um, one of the things that I really like to do is put uh, an iron rich glaze up front. And so you get the ash hitting it strongly and creating grays. And then you also get um, lines of crystals down the side. Um, you get little tiny gold flecks that you might not be able to see on camera. But again, that's a reward of owning these pieces and living with them. Uh, but this is just a stellar example of the type of thing that is alluring about wood firing. So thanks so much. <laughs> All right. Oh, let me pause that so I won't go into the next uh, YouTube video. <laughs> I say, I just kind of want to climb in and see what else is going on. There. <laughs> that, that was the best firing so far. Uh, we nice. put a, yeah, we put a shelf up on the chimney, and and now I need to figure out who's going to climb up there and and put take half of it away because we burned so much wood. Um, we need, we needed to do something to stop the pull, but oh man, those pots were beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so. Nice. Yeah. They looked amazing. They looked amazing. So, you know, worth a few extra hours time, a little more wood, right? <laughs> it was a lot more wood. It was, it was yeah. a really good time, a good group. Yeah. That was the firing that we started getting, uh, Magnum ice cream bars at the end of every firing, oh, which is a really good, um, tradition to start. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I'm, I like that. Does anybody have questions for Amy?
Well, I have to attest to how good of a job you do of creating the community and just having loading really fair. And I, I don't know. I, I feel like I could go on with questions of poke and prod you to share more about the community building aspect of it, but you have really amazing people that you've built up around you. Oh. The people who go there really, really appreciate what you have um, developed there. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, Lisa was um, part of my crew from day one as she moved out to the Midwest just in time to be a huge help um, in helping me to figure out my kiln. And um, it's so sad that she's moved moved away, but um, you're definitely a big part of, of the beauty that's, you know, like being made there because we, we troubleshot, we figure out a lot of, a lot of mistakes <laughs> like those early days. So. Good times. <laughs> so yeah, Margaret, the iron rich glazes to Tenmoku. I, I only have two glazes in my arsenal at the moment. One is the Shino and one is the Tenmoku. And um, I just love the way it gets bleached um, and turns gold and gray when it's when it gets super hot. And Valerie, thank you. Yeah, I um I I really do. Like I, I hope that you know, we can build a bigger audience for wood-fired pottery because it is just so cool to, to live and own. And you can tell that comes across as I'm unloading a good firing. <laughs> so. yeah, super exciting. Tell us about what clay were you using on the piece that you made and what clay bodies do you use in general? Um, yeah, so all of my horizontal pieces, so my bowls and platters are um, a stoneware that Mike Taylor makes in um, Saugatuck, Michigan, or Fenville, I guess he's sort of in between. And um, so then I use Laguna's wood fire B mix for all of my spiral. Anne Marie coined signature spiral, is what she <laughs> has coined for my work. Um, so that's Laguna wood fire B mix, but now I've started using um, Continental's porcelain, domestic porcelain um to see what fun I could have with that so I'm kind of playing with all three clay bodies and they all get recycled together um was it B-mix or B-mix wood that you were using B-mix wood yeah. B-mix wood yeah so which also performs beautifully in soda it, it, it does in fact I I don't have any boxes of that at all <laughs> yeah are people seeing so I really filled up with clay in the fall and have people been seeing issues with uh ordering clay or are we all waiting for spring well I sure hope not because I'm almost out of clay <laughs> yeah so at Wilson all I had left was 2020 clay um and it had been sitting there for two years and so it was pretty stiff and for new students it was pretty rough and I had finally gotten a pug mill there but I really didn't have any reclaim except for stuff that was just completely dry so to be able to like try and get anything workable I mean it just took me weeks and Finally, we got down to like three boxes of the old clay left. And I was like, I kind of ordered some clay. So I ordered it from Clayworks and I ordered, I, you know, I tried to order no less than a thousand pounds. So you get kind of that lower rate on the per pound of clay overall. And I ordered some for myself. I usually piggyback them and that way I can kind of combine it to make sure that I'm, you know, being frugal. Um, yeah. And uh, when I got the bill, I almost fell over and I gave it to my department head and he sent out an email to the entire art department. Like there's only X dollars left in the art budget now that we've paid for the clay. And I was like, oh crap. <laughs> so just be careful because even at the discounted rate, it was like double per pound. Uh, okay, well, I had no video. idea. I really had no idea. You know, I'm not spending 60 pounds, 60 cents a pound on porcelain. I'm spending 60 cents a pound on stoneware. So, yikes. Now I'm scared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I so am I because I have four boxes of Troy porcelain on back order. And I'm wondering what that's going to run me. <laughs> yeah, wherever you can drive to go pick up clay, do it now. Probably is. <laughs> like, don't ship it. Well, you know, I mean, they're... Um, you know, Clayworks is great because they only charge like $90 to bring it all 
to the college and then I just have them bring all my stuff and then I just kind of slowly peel my stuff off a few boxes at a time or whatever but um yeah I mean I feel like the price of clay was almost double (laughs) fantastic (laughs) yeah and and I'm I need to get some brick for my kiln too so those seem to be not not quite as bad um but I've got to get it here so um Tim, Tim informed me, Tim said he'd get it for me, but he did also inform me that diesel's like 525 a gallon. So <laughs> yeah, just, uh, you know, I would say do what you can, maybe uh, I don't know, raise your, you could do what the oil companies do and raise your prices to be commensurate with what you expect to pay for product later. Um, unfortunately, that might be the solution. Yeah, yeah. Yikes. Yikes. So I really like that form. How, how much of it do you think you ended up trimming away? Oh, I don't know. I'll, I'll, a lot. <laughs> it's probably maybe a five, five pounds still wet. Yeah. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> well, you know, I'd rather like in, in my mind too, I think I'd rather trim away more than have either not get the shape that I want or just start getting some sagging in places that, you know, it's hard enough to like ha- use all the muscle work to get that big pot. You don't want to lose it. Yeah. So I can see that. And where'd you get that platter plate trimmer or whatever that is? Cause that thing is cool. <laughs> no. So my friend, Ann Marvie, Leah, you know, I was at an art fair in 2019 and met somebody who happened to do MFA work at a wood kiln in Japan. And she lives like closer to the barn than I do. <laughs> and so uh Anne is now my main overnight help. She loves the night shift. And so she um yeah, and she watched me. She she saw that I was trimming with like a little Dolan tool and she was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> so yeah, she made me uh two trimming tools like that, and they're just beautiful. So yeah, no. Well, Troy, I think I think you have a tool you need to start making for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe yeah, I've the pictures. <laughs> I have been uh, looking at that kind of a tool and trying out different kinds of metals to see if I could make it. Cool. Yeah, and then because I broke the sure form, man, bef- the, before a show a week and a half ago, like I, I had broken it in half and I used it so much that I was really cutting into my fingers. So like a small sure form too is something. <laughs> something like- Maybe sure form, yeah. Yeah, that would be good. Awesome, Amy. Well, I'm excited to see more about what you have going on this year. You have uh, any uh, any workshops? Uh, it sounded like you you had a calendar out there. Maybe you can give us a little more insight into what you got going on. Yeah. So at the end of April is the I'm going to do one firing workshop per year that I lead. So that's April 28th this year. There's still a few spots open for that. Um, so we basically spend, um, two days prepping work and loading the kiln and then, uh, 48 hours, give or take for firing the kiln and then take the weekend off and then come back for the unload. Um, and I really share the, the kiln spaces is for the participants. So you get to bring a lot of pottery, um, and you get a lot out of it. Um, I'm also, I've got an art education background, so I really believe in getting people into the kiln and loading and teaching um, and taking the time to do that. And then I've got two helpers so that no one is firing the wood kiln by themselves, um, like when they don't know what they're doing. So you've got guidance. We do, we do teach how to front stoke and we teach how to side stoke. So we, people are a part of that, but also um, knowing that like, there's somebody there to like talk through what the heck is going on with all these air holes and the firebox and why is it shooting flame out of my face? And so we, we try and get quality and safety <laughs> worked into it as well. So good. good. And then, uh, the visiting artist workshop this year is Simon Levin is coming out and Anne Marie is coming out to assist. Nice. And yeah, so that's in October. I think the second is the first day of it. Um, You're asking me. <laughs> yeah, there's there's one spot left for that. Um, and then we do want to start a wait list. Um, just like last year, it was really comforting that somebody had to cancel for health reasons and uh, I was able to refund it completely. So 
Yeah. Irene, you know you want to do it. Come on out. <laughs> Chicago area. I want to see the little dots in the kill. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Well, yeah, no, that sounds super exciting. That sounds super exciting and, and, and highly enticing, I must say. Um, <laughs> we have a good time. We and do. We're going to have the demonstration workshop. Well, yes. cool. So if you came out, you could actually see me work. <laughs> Anybody <laughs> yeah. who didn't get to see it in the video. So yeah, I'm very much looking forward to seeing exactly how she makes all that magic work in person. Yeah. So, <laughs> for a long time <laughs> there, well you know there's something to be said for like the little things that you catch when you watch somebody work real time and for a period of time too that you may not otherwise notice you know um in in a quick glance or looking at their work or even just you know catching a quick demo like you know getting that that more in-depth uh experience can be really really insightful even if you think you know everything you know you don't <laughs> there's always something to learn so awesome awesome well well thanks amy and thanks Anne marie i appreciate your time so much and uh i think we're going to uh cede the floor to lisa if there aren't any other questions anybody else have any questions mm -hmm. all right thank you it's fun to watch Thanks, everybody. <laughs>